we're going to let the panel be all yours. And uh, if you just continue to lead, we'll, Thank you. we'll be ready to go. Thank you. Appreciate it. Doing great. Yes. Excellent. OK. Uh, yes. Can we have our slide, please? Sorry. Ah. Here we go. Good. There is one fellow named Roger Buxa who has been just left out here just by some <laughs> error of some way. I don't know. Roger Buxa is the mechanical manager of Arpies North. He's been in industry for 35 years. He works on larger commercial and institutional projects, including the arena and the airport. In his free time, Roger is all about motocross, and we welcome you, Roger. Thank you. And uh, so sorry to have left you out a bit. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead, George. It's all yeah. yours. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so what we have, we have an excellent panel, panelist. Uh, we have uh, uh, the entire, uh, really, variety of players on a project. We have the owner organization. Uh, we have the engineer. We have the construction general contractor, the architect, and the subcontractor. So we have diversified. Uh, uh, opinion here in, in the room and really experienced people. We had very good discussion. And we had, uh, I, I prepared a few questions actually for, for the panel to think about. These are the questions, but we are panelists, we are not limited to this. And also we will be happy to receive some of your questions as well. Uh, these are the questions we, we asked, how to improve our construction performance, especially now. And by the way, the infrastructure project now, we need them more than ever before. We really need them. Uh, what are the barriers that preventing us from doing a better job or improving uh, what we are doing? What can we do to change the mindset, the existing practices, mindset, how we behave and how we work together, which is, I think, personally, the most difficult one. And how to build the trust and collaborative relationship. That's the, the touchy-feely thing. I think it's time that we start thinking about it. Uh, we, we're going to succeed together when we can build this uh, relationship. And so I'm going to go to my panelists, uh, uh, starting with and Andrew. You bring your, your uh, point of view from the politician point of view and the owner as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure about the, uh, the first piece. Um, I think that, you know, historically, um, I think historically, we, yeah. Hello. Yep. Uh, historically, we've not done a good job of um, having the planning um, complete, uh, and I think you mentioned George the scope uh, before we um, were forced to have dirt flying for whatever reason. Um, I think we're in a better position with the governance structure um, to have that PEO, um, to have clear accountabilities. Uh, we're setting the, the Calgary Cancer Project, our biggest ever vertical project in the government of Alberta, up for success. Um, I think you'll, you'll see a change in the way we do business. Uh, there are challenges. Um, now is the time to get out there. But, you know, if we don't have projects properly planned and the scope um, locked, which is uh, probably an alien term in our health world, um, then we're going to struggle. I think the other challenge we've got with performance um, from our perspective is, you know, we're looking at, for instance, again, Calgary Cancer. If you're going to open that facility in 2023, 24, how do you build in the high-end technology now when you don't know where technology will be in six to eight years? Um, everyone was saying miniaturization was moving forward. We're not seeing that in the health world, um, but it's a challenge and, and we're going to take it head on. Very good. Excellent. Thank you very much. You see the technology. We don't know what technology is going to happen in, in, in a few years from now. This is why we need to keep scope allowance for this purpose just in case. We can, if we can't commit today, so it's good. But the public, the media, everybody should know about this one. So this is why the scope change will help you in that budget for it. We don't know. But if, as soon as you give one number now for everything and something change, this is the measure. Cost over. Yes, please, Adam. Uh, so thank you for being here. And thank you. sorry for not being here this morning to have a conversation with you. Before I start, I'd just like to see, is Councillor Nichols still in the room? He left. OK, good. Uh, <laughs> and, and secondly, 
Do we have any lawyers in the room? Excellent. Plus two here. Um, so I think from my perspective, and, and sorry, Andrew. Andrew. Andrew hit on it. It's um, some of the challenges we face is the political environment that we're in, especially as an owner, in terms of expectations or what I would call sometimes unrealistic expectations around how we're going to deliver the infrastructure we need to deliver. And I think that is one of our biggest challenges, especially with our councillors, to um, articulate some of the, the risks that Dr. George just referred to around what are some of these scope out allowances that we need and what are some of these contingencies that we need in relation to where we're at uh, in terms of the design. So I think one of our biggest challenges that we're trying to overcome, especially with this new department that we're creating, is to have more of a conversation with council about that so that, that when we start a project or would like to initiate a project, they're, they're clear on what the risks are. Uh, we do our best to quantify what those risks are. We work with industry to help us inform what those risks are, but it's a clear conversation <coughs> before we dive into determining what a budget is. And I asked the question earlier about lawyers because I think I've had conversations with a number of contractors and um, one of the new things out there is integrated project delivery. And uh, uh, a few folks I've talked to they just identify that as, well, that's the way we used to do construction. It was collaborative. It was, this is something that's going to change. I got your back, you got mine. And I think through the years, there's this been this protectionism of all players, all the partners, that has really taken us in a direction where, where we're, we're, we're so concerned about that litigious side that we don't get to the root of how do we work collaboratively on delivering the infrastructure that uh, that we need for Albertans, Edmontonians, and, and others. Um, so I think for me the mindset change has to be how do we work more collaboratively and how do we make sure that that we're we're clear with each other what we're trying to accomplish and how we're going to accomplish it. So uh, a bit from the city I of Edmonton it. there. I, I, I must defend the lawyers actually. The lawyers are a service available to us. We need leadership to instruct the lawyers to write the proper contract. The clauses that lawyers write, because I am here to defend your interest, and what they do, this is what they teach them in uh, law faculties in Alberta and, and Calgary, and is push the risk to the other side. It's risk, push the risk to the other side. So they write it, they do their job. Our job as professionals, we lost control. Our job as leaders and managers, we just say, oh, no, 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 I want a balanced approach. What is fair, what's not fair. By the way, legally, everything they do is fair. I showed you the, uh, the Alberta uh, infrastructure contract clause, no damage for <coughs> delay. It is fair. This case went to the Supreme Court of Canada and the contractor lost because you agreed to it and you priced it. So it's fair. We told you, you are the contractor, you take everything and you price it. That's the approach that we, uh, uh, yourself, as leaders in this room, we need to start saying enough is enough. We have to do something about it. So the lawyer should be your counsel. That's what they call themselves, counsel. Okay, they could tell you about uh, uh, all kind of risk, but you need to decide, in this case, I'm gonna take this. I'm gonna keep that risk. Where is the leadership to, uh, that can say this? If we. I will tell you a story, another story, because we listen to the lawyers more than to the engineers and project managers and architects. That's the problem. I, I think that's where I was going. Was yes. That, that I think we've become so reliant on, yes. on their advice that we forget about the bigger picture, which is what are we trying to accomplish? There we go. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. And I think that you know, we've, we've got out of the point of legal risk is one of the risks, and we've allowed it to override everything else. Thank you. And, and we're trying to move that back to keep us, keep us legal, but let us yes. manage the risks. And by the way, if somebody said, I want a contract that is team-based, OK, already in Britain, there is a contract document in Britain. It's partnering-based contract. All we are the team and the collaborative. So, we, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. The wheel already invented. Alan? The note up there is how to improve con uh, construction performance in Alberta. And, and it's good we're hearing from, from the, the top end of a project that, that you see the need to make change and get better. And I think from the contracting industry, we need to do the same. And how to do that is we do need better information coming down from above, clear, concise information, 
And in turn, we need to give that to our partners like Roger, that they know what to build, when to build, and how to build it. Um, you showed the picture up there, the, the two boats, and everybody laughed, and, 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 and rightfully so. But were you thinking about the dollars, or were you thinking about the scope of the project or the complexity of the project? All the time, we get the job, but it's not the job we thought it was, because changes come in place. And when those changes come, we have to adapt to that. And the adaption is both in schedule, cost, and quality at times. So for us to do our job as general contractors, we don't know what you want, clearly. <clears throat> we agree when you want it, which makes sense from a construction point of view, not always the political point of view. We have to be fair with that and be honest to each other. And lastly is, what does it take to deliver that? Because a lot of times our performance is dictated by things we can't control, and Georgie mentioned that, weather. To put a project out in, in September and say, I want it done by the following fall, there's one construction season in there where you can't do a lot of work. So is that thought through in the schedule so the performance can come at the right time of the year so that that risk is taken away? It's a risk we own, but we're gonna give you the price of that risk. So when we look at the construction of the building and the ways and means to build it and the methods of actually the design should also be thought through the time of year we need to build it at the right point in time. And a lot of that may have been done at the start, but the project gets delayed, delayed. That was to come out in the spring, comes out in the fall, but we haven't changed that methodology, nor for the contractors in the room, the schedule never seems to change based on the delay of design, because that end date is always there. So that, that performance, if we need to meet that end date, we need all that information up front, clear and concise, so that Roger, his team that works with us, we can deliver that. And we want to do that on time. But a lot of times we get handcuffed and we see those, that big boat coming by and that stops us from being able to be nimble and agile as we had planned with that little boat that we can maneuver through the, the weeds, as we call it, to get to the, to the shore or the dock, which we want to do. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. I just want to touch on what you said, quality, cost, schedule. And I think from, and, and Andrew, I'm assuming you're in the same boat, but from, a, from an owner's perspective, quality isn't something that we're prepared to sacrifice. Uh, and you, you know, you can talk about finishes or, or look or, or aesthetics, but at the end of the day, the quality is something that we wouldn't sacrifice. So then it comes down to schedule and budget. And I think what, what we need to develop is a conversation around when there is a change or when there is an issue, uh, what are the impacts, schedule, budget, and how do we quantify those to be able to figure out a path forward? And that's, that's where I, I keep going back to. It's got to be a lot more collaborative uh, to be able to get there. Excellent. I, I, I like that. Uh, but actually, it's the time is a must. If you think about mega project, time is paramount. Cost, you will exceed cost for whatever reason. We talked about them, risk and changes, and some of them are valid. But if we collaborate, the engineers and architects and construction, they can produce better engineering that will go to construction, then we will have less, less changes. But regardless, we will have changes. But time, if the project is late, is disastrous on mega project, especially in industrial, industrial loss of production. So they, they must meet it. In, in, in your infrastructure project, still the reputation, the commitment, the political uh, fallout of, of that delay. But the dollar value, I think we can be forgiven if we, we've done a proper risk assessment. We uh, accounted for all the three types of risk. Probably some of you, this is the very first time you've seen this way we cut the risk into three major categories. I'm going to send you uh, uh, in, in the document a book that I co-authored, which explains these risks in detail. I'm going to send you a PDF a copy of it, but please don't tell uh, the, the publisher, because they will sue me. <laughs> Makes sense? So, so really need to think about risk, how we account for them, including the changes that will happen. Please, anybody tells you there will be no change on this project, we are misleading each other. Let's forget this. Timely changes, that's I accept. And timely changes killing us. And timely changes, the more changes you have during construction is the, is the costly one. This is why contractors like to talk about impact cost. And owners in this room and engineers and architects, you don't like the word impact because it, it's the cost is mushrooming. It's becoming bigger and bigger. 
Matt? Uh, thanks, uh, George. From my perspective, um, I think we're under more pressure today than we ever have been before uh, with the advent of social media and uh, the speed at which information is shared to the public. So there's far more pressure from the public in terms of timeliness of delivery of a service, whether that's a school being built in their neighborhood, a new hospital for an aging population, or a, uh, or a new ring road around uh, one of our cities. And so uh, there's a lot of political pressure then to uh, project and to make promises to the public, and that squeezes all of us. Uh, you mentioned uh, we, we've seen the problems, we, we know what they are, we know what the solutions are, and I think what we're really lacking is the leadership to make the decision that we are going to change how we deliver projects. And uh, it will mean refining our contracts and the organizational relationships uh, between us. Uh, on the personal relationship side, that's the easy piece. We, we all contribute to our communities, whether it's volunteering on hockey teams or ringette teams. Uh, we're all in it for the community. But when it comes to the organizational side, uh, we seem to make different decisions. And uh, whether it's the lawyers or somebody else procurement making those decisions or imposing their will on a process, I think that's where we need the leadership to say, hey, listen, guys, that's one component of this, but there's more to it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Chris? And I would like to return to the issue of scope. <clears throat> and despite what um, the owners think, uh, or would like to think, is the fact that this, the scope is set up properly at the front. It's not certainly the case. It's not the case in most of the projects, and uh, very complex projects have a very difficult scope to define. Um, I'll speak a little bit about our, our own experience, and I think I hope that will illustrate. Uh, Paul Verhassen, who is sitting here from uh, Clark Builders, will know the project that uh, I'm talking about. Um, the scope is clear when the project is finished. This is the only time that actually everything is done, and we know that's exactly the scope. It could be short, but we didn't get this, we didn't get that, but that's the only time the scope is clear. That's what is defined. At the beginning of that, it's a list of needs, program requirements, performance requirements, and everything else. The story that I wanted to relate to, it actually illustrates this very well. Most of us, most of us, ever have an opportunity to do the same project twice. And we had it once, a situation like that. There was a project that we got a client walking into our office and said, we want exactly the building like that. We like it a lot. You guys did a terrific job, and we're going to buy this project. How much is it? Okay, we'll look up the AAA uh, recommended fee schedule, and there's a formula for so-called repeat projects. We believe we follow the formula. So I think that would be a perfect example. The client came and said, yeah. exactly what you built. I said, that's good. That works for us. I think you can sell the same thing twice. You should make money. Well, we didn't. The reason we didn't, because despite the fact that this client even believed that the scope is very clear, when it came to it, I said, really like that, but you know, actually, this part, not really like that, because we need it bigger. Oh. And then this should be taller, yes. and something else changed. And that taught us a very valuable lesson, even in this situation. And I'm not talking about an obvious thing that the geotechnical conditions are different. Yes. Okay? That's an obvious. You put it somewhere else, it affects the substructure. Uh, there was a case in which functional requirements, the things the client could have seen and could have assessed and said, this is exactly what I want, that didn't really quite work out. So even in this particular case, we had to do changes, and the client had a little bit of a difficulty, even at that time, accepting the fact that we said, I'm sorry, this actually involves quite a bit of work that we have to redo. And once you touch one particular stone, the avalanche may come down. And it did in some cases. In the end, of course, we made it uh, a successful project, successful meaning it was built. It was built the client wanted, and eventually we negotiated some parts of it, and I guess we met somewhere halfway through. But it was a very interesting aspect on discussion about the scope. So, no, I don't agree that the clients at the scope, or even if we'd establish the scope, it is the finite element and it's finished. It affects us incredibly because most of us in our business are also asked this horrible question, how much? How much for what? Well, that's the scope. 
how much for that? And then, of course, we have to apply the risks. We have to apply certain contingencies because that is never properly defined. So that's the yeah. aspect of the scope and how do you improve it is perhaps having a, having a meeting of mind on the beginning through integrated process or whatever you, um, way you call it. When we build a house, I don't know, we probably sit down and see that's how much we need and the scope is better defined. It's probably at the end of the process is never exactly what we wanted to accomplish, yeah. even in the case if it's a repeat project, so-called repeat project, yeah. which actually wasn't. Excellent. Thank you very much. Amazing. This is a great example that uh, expect scope change, expect change, embrace change, deal with them in an agile way and account for them in your estimate. And that's the second ca category of risk. That, uh, I call it enterprise risk. So the owner should take that responsibility, should budget for it. By the way, these buckets of risk I'm talking about, keep the bucket within the owner organization. Keep it. If I'm the city, I'll keep this risk. If the scope changes, I'll pay. If the scope doesn't change, keep it. Hopefully nothing will change. But regardless, since Babylon, uh, until now, every project has changed. Now we have the subcontractor here. And, and also, I tried to tease him the other day to say something nasty about the general contractor. He would not do that. <laughs> Okay, I'm not even going to pick on the owners here. Um, I, I'm gonna, more interested in the in constructability and the integration of technology into the projects. We have a very good example right now. Uh, downtown Edmonton, we're putting a little building up. Um, we have the problem with the documentation to start with. Um, but I think that the, the only way to get through something like this is to have a, a collaborative team. And uh, with PCL heading it up, they have brought the group together. Um, we've use BIM extensively in the project, which has made a, a huge difference in actually getting the building together. Um, a lot less rework. Uh, we've found all the problems before they actually go in. Um, one of the problems with uh, technology and uh, is the integration of it down to the bottom levels. Um, everyone loves to see, well, yes, you've put a nice 3D model together here and everything works. Well, it doesn't work if the people in the field actually don't have the proper information and can't use it. Um, I was told not to get too detailed in the technologies here, but uh, without having the whole team together working as a group, we're not going to get anywhere and everyone's going to spend more money than they want to. Uh, a contractor's in it for the dollar, <coughs> owner's in it to saving a dollar. Together, as a group, if we can utilize everything at our disposal, uh, we can actually have a successful project where the owner is satisfied and the contractor actually made a dollar and can move on to the next project. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I, I like the, the word you, you dropped is uh, constructability. And constructability does not happen if these two people working separately from him and him. It doesn't happen. So we design things and then we go to the job site and now, now we need to have more uh, practical aspect uh, came in. So that's one. So we need to, how we bring those together the other one is on mega project, the engineer will design, especially the, 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 what I learned in the oil sand project and mega project. The engineer will design whatever they want to design. But when they go to construction, this is not the construction sequence. So what I'm trying to push now, the construction sequence should really uh, mandate engineering sequence. Are you with me? Almost like the design and engineering should be serving construction. Because without it, we will send, we'll say 30% complete or 50% or 80, useless the, the uh, 80%. I want, now I'm dealing with excavation, I'm dealing with piling, I'm dealing with a, a foundation. Get me those first. These are the first one I'm going to start. On a complex project, we have different plants and different th areas. Which area need to be built first? The engineer or architect, they don't know your method of construction. So the only way is that integration. We can do it with a traditional contract, uh, with, with any kind of contract. You don't need to change the contract. Just adopt this concept. We are one team, and we need each other. But it starts with, with the owner. They are the leader of the team. They are the leader, provide leadership, provide oversight throughout the life cycle. When I said the sponsor, what is the role of the sponsor? It is really making decision and then provide oversight 
on the rest of the project. What you're going to have problem is probably the business unit, like the transit guys, and I don't know what guys, said, what, are you taking uh, my power away from me? All of that thing. So you have enough problem within the city. I don't know. Uh, I, I wish you all the best how you're going to bring everything together. <laughs> Yeah, I, I meant it. it's not easy. You are creating a revolution, and, and, and no, no other city probably has done it, as far as I know, the way you are doing it. But no that's, pressure, right? Eh? Yeah. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Uh, uh, so, so that please, the word contractibility. It does not happen without working together. You said about quality. You say this is my quality. I want this quality. They need to do it. Then the constructability guys might change the quality. The engineer and artist said, no way, you can't change it. Fine. So the decision is still engineering because it's design. But those guys can, can help us in the practical elements, how we build things easier and practical. And that, this is will increase pro your productivity, guys, if we are talking productivity. If I may add to Please. it, uh, one of our more, most successful projects was exactly along the line of it was in a formal integrated design yeah. uh, project, but, but certainly we see and hear more and more about the integrated design uh, approaches, different names, different, depending you talk to the lawyer, is a different thing, yeah. is a contractual, is not contractual. But part, uh, the huge part of it is, is the meeting of mind, but it's also on the, on the plane that is allowed. Uh, so there is the success that we have uh, certainly experienced was exactly where the, the right team was given with the uh, with the owner, was led by the owner, who said, actually, this part of the issues left with me, I'm not going to bother you with this. Okay, they are not, they are sort of this sphere that you say, oh, it's a, perhaps it's a political equivalent or something like that. Yeah. But we, let's focus on the project, and you guys know how to do it. So yeah. that this integration aspect of it has been very successful because of of we were allowed to do what we believe that we are actually doing, what we are, believe that we are the best, which is design, engineering, and construction. Excellent. All of other issues are influencers on what we do, Excellent. but they are to a very large extent sometimes the brakes yeah. on the car that moves on. Excellent. Gentlemen, can I ask the audience if you have questions or comments? I'm going to go here and see. Uh, there is a gentleman here. You, cl you are the only one who clapped for me, so I'm going to ask you to ask questions. Okay. If there is no mic, I am coming to you. You see, this is uh, biased. Oh, I don't. Oh, you want me to speak in the Yeah, why not? Oh, thank why you. Not? Yeah. Well, my question really relates to the business that you mentioned very casually, which is the cost, uh, shall we say, the ad adoption of project cost by the owners and running with it before it's final. This is the worst nightmare for most project managers and engineers. Can you elaborate on that? How can we solve that, particularly the manager from the city? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was, uh, I think it's something that is, is becoming more and more challenging. And, and George mentioned the, the mega projects or the complex projects. and. And the processes that we have are, here's your budget, and it's four to five, but that means it's four. And it's a constant challenge for the city to try and scope based on the level of detail we have, because part, you know, particularly because it's driven by a political uh, need to accomplish something. So some of the things that we're looking at from the city perspective is actually, and I, and I heard George say, the gate system. We're actually looking at uh, or wanting to create a bit of a, a gating system for funding approval to allow us to get to um, stages of design to to allow us to have more accuracy in terms of what is the the scope of the project um, and it's funny one of the other things that he identified was this um, this owner's allowance and and we've been talking about uh, we call it a corporate contingency to allow us to be able to as a corporation, protect ourselves for those things that as things change, we can accommodate them. So uh, from my perspective, and, and I am an engineer, and I know that you clapped because you said pay the engineers, so I, I get it. Um, I, I do sub, uh, prescribe to that notion of let's, let's get to uh, a healthy level of detail to inform what it is we're, we're needing to do from a budget and schedule perspective. I think the nuance that we need is we need to engage the industry that is construction 
subcontractors and suppliers to help inform that throughout the process. So uh, I don't know the mechanisms to do that, but I will say preference here is that we get to a level of detail where we're comfortable around the budget rather than um, prescribing it on 5% engineering. Andrew? Yeah, thanks. I, I think we're slightly ahead. We're moving to a new capital planning and approvals process where you'll take a full business case uh, to Treasury Board where <laughs> it's not just the capital cost, but if we put a, ho a hospital up, within three years you've spent the same on operating it. And we need to look at the life cycle of the facility. So we're now looking for, um, and, and you saw it a little bit in the last budget, and you'll see it, I hope, more in this one, that there'll be more planning uh, or allocations against a project for planning to allow us to go to full business case, to go for a next gated approval, and then if they want to fund the next level, it means a full functional program. And at the end of that, you're going to get a lot higher cost certainty before we go to market. Um, there are challenges, uh, Alan touched on it, the transparency. People want to know, um, and the government has committed to the sunshine list, but I think they're starting to see that that does challenge uh, and there's got to be a set time to be transparent and before you've gone to market is certainly in my mind not the time to do it. Yet if you look at the last budget they got criticized heavily for not allocating all the money to Calgary Cancer in the budget. Well if it's over eight years and your budget window's five you're not going to allocate it um, and that doesn't help anybody and it, it's a challenge for the politicians and I think it's a challenge for us uh, as we try and gain more certainty in projects. And, and adding to that and it's not a competition here, but we, we do have business cases. Um, I think the other piece of that, that you touched on is administratively, there, there has to be a culture change that is not about let's fit it into a budget cycle or yeah. let's fit it into a budget yeah. envelope. Yeah. Let's understand what the scope is and, and rationalize it to a point where we're comfortable saying to our political officials, this is what we need to deliver what you want. Matt? Yeah, just from a, an engineering perspective, I think it's always great when you have the opportunity to sit down with your client and talk about what the project outcomes you're looking for are so that uh, you can then talk about uh, the scope and clearly define that. And even if you have a starting budget in mind, like I've got five million or 10 million, it gives you a place to start from. I would never go build a, my own personal residence without having a number in mind because there's probably no way I could afford what I actually want. Uh, but what can I afford what I actually need in terms of a project outcome, whether that's O&M, whether that's life cycle costs, or whether that's just something I want to flip on the market. So I think um, having that opportunity to really sit down and work with the, cl the client owner uh, to define the scope and come up with an appropriate budget is incredibly important well before it ever gets out to the political guys. Because I think that's where we run up, and I'm sure you do as well, where a commitment is made to the public and then we're all handcuffed. And I think the challenge, the challenge for us has been, and, and Alan may start seeing this with the reorganization, that although I'm the owner, I'm delivering on behalf of Alberta Health Services or Neil delivering on behalf of Culture with the Royal Alberta Museum or others. And, and there's been a mindset of um, wants rather than identified needs. Uh, and Alberta's been a rich province and they've never said no to a physician um, or, a, or a justice or a lawyer. Um, and now things have changed and it's not about can we spend this 10 and go back for 100 more, it's can we spend eight and reinvest two on something else. And that's a huge shift in culture, but we're moving that way. Alan? And just the point is when, when those projects that are, have come out with a pre-stated budget and a plan, it goes to proposal to find a construction manager. And the budget is stated in there and the budget is nowhere near enough that we can see to build the project that you want. We have to propose on a certain budget and then you ask for a full scope of services. So do we, our challenge is do we propose on the budget size and that's gonna get right size to the program or do you propose on the drawings which show much bigger dollar value? And that's usually our conundrum of coming across and we ask the question, it's, that's all the budget approved so then you've got to come back. If we under, underprice it based on the dollar, there's more services and time for the bigger one. How do we deal with that? And how do we, and it goes to this discussion, but on the political side, you don't have the money yet, so you can't say what the value is. So it's a chicken and egg through there, but you're passing that information down the line to groups then that have to respond when it really comes up, and that creates that friction and saying, well, you should have known. And this is probably a good segue only to remind uh, ourselves of 
the vehicles like that that we're talking about right now. One of them is a QBS. I would like to bring it a quality-based uh, selection, which in principle puts the issue of the cost for that particular a little bit further down, by the, which allows both the qualifications and the, essentially as assembling the right team, and then with that right team, with the owner playing very significant role in it, defining uh, what can be defined to the extent it can be defined, including the cost and the scope. So, and the, what City of Calgary is doing, the slide that you're showing, uh, seems to be indicating that particular direction. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, just w one comment on the City of Calgary. Uh, so they they are looking for money from the federal government, which is committed. Uh, they have money. The city committed. They are looking third of the money from the provincial government. Third of what? Is it four or five? What if it becomes six billion? Okay, so the city of Calgary and politicians and administrators will have bigger problem. So, so uh, uh, the gated process, Adam, you're right. Phase one, phase two, phase three. Each phase, we need to prepare an, a guess, an estimate, and the accuracies are very wide. The risks are big, but these are for proceeding purposes to the next phase only. The more detail, more accuracy going to happen. But regardless, even if I do detailed engineering, uh, Chris, your example, there will be changes. I need those contingencies in the three buckets, please. The three buckets, and we name them that way. So the contingency only for the unknowns within the original scope of work. The scope allowance for the unknowns outside the scope of work within the control of the organization, but outside the control of the project team. The, the management reserve outside the control of the entire team and outside the control of the company itself, market condition, oil prices go up and down. So, so let, let me uh, veer you to another way. What about the collaborative relationship? Can we work more collaboratively? Is this word of trust it doesn't exist. Uh, can we say it with confidence uh, in, in our construction and engineering? Is it a taboo, a bad word, or good word? W people said about the mindset. What do we need to change to do something differently tomorrow? I need a comment from, from the crowd here. And, uh, and we have two mics now. Thank you, John. What about fast tracking? Okay, uh, John, they are, you are thinking. Let me show you a story, what happens. This is the start. Uh, all of you know schedule, milestone schedule. You are looking at the back of it from, okay. Transparent <laughs> schedule. Transparency. transparency, this is transparency. The end of the schedule. Yeah, and this is the first diamond is the start. Are you with me? You saw the gated process, start. The, the last one is this, is a completion. In between, what are we gonna have? Look at your dilemma, guys. This is, then we have these milestones, of feasibility, economics, engineering, architecture, engineering, detail engineering, procurement, and this chunk is construction. Are you with me? You visualize that? Did you agree that our, most of our project as fast-tracked, i.e. this completion date is not reasonable? Okay, guess what happened in reality? You sign a contract, this is what's gonna happen. This approval by this date, do you expect it to happen on the same day? Exactly. Do you expect that some of them will be pushed this way? And engineer and architect will delay the owner approval, different silos within the owner organization. By the time they approved, we will push these uh, uh, milestone this way. Do you agree so far? I want to see a young, engineer in the room. What's going to happen to the, uh, the completion date? Young engineer, what do you think going to happen on a completion date? We push, 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 push. What's going to happen to the completion date? Huh? Yeah, not met. So what, are you gonna, what do you think the owner would say? It's gonna, thank you. It's gonna stay the same. Uh, in my classes, I ask the young engineers. I say this, this, this. I say, yeah, George, we will push this, this way. Because logic and common sense. Common sense is no longer common sense. So what happened is, 
not only we start fast track project, but we fast track the fast track. You tell me why we have cost overrun? That's another, another story. We have the early warning signs available to all of us. That's one of them. Look at your schedule. If you push, 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 nothing happened to this one, we have a problem. If we start issuing too many changes, too many changes, too many changes, there is a problem in the scope, correct? And these are the early warning signs for a project manager to get out of here. <laughs> OK, yes. George, I think that um, in our, a lot of these projects, including the one we're doing downtown currently, is fast track. Mm. Um, in order to do them correctly, uh, I think they got to start with the team to begin with. I don't think uh, the yes. lowest bidder is the way to go with any of this. And mm. I think everyone agrees with that. Um, I think that if the owner has the opportunity and they can pick the, even a small group of contractors they want to work with. Yeah. And once they get them picked, and then that contractor goes out and gets a select group of, of, of contractors to, to, to build the project. Um, someone they can work with, some of the technology, some of the forces. Uh, selecting the, the lowest bid is not going to get you that. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. And you sure aren't going to have uh, access to a lot of the technologies that uh, but, some but, of these companies don't but have. But government organization, even pri big uh, private sector organization, uh, they, know, well, they want to show that there is a process, that we followed it, and the lowest compliant bidder gets the job, in, uh, especially government construction, always the same. But this does not mean that we cannot do it legally differently. Just develop a criteria, selection criteria. Contractors or engineers, we can have a criteria. The, the best contractor, I'm going to go talk construction, the, will be awarded to the one who fulfills the following. Okay, prior experience, relevant experience, the team. You can put a weight similar to what I showed you. And a price could be a factor or no factor. It's up to you. Could be, you give it a weight of 10% or 100%. There is no legal limitation, but it seems the owner organization are more focusing on uh, the lowest bid. And that needs a little bit more leadership to, to, to deal with it. Not every project I, we need to go and select the team or pre-select, but on major project, uh, complex project, maybe you should. Yeah. George, given the opportunity we have today, and I'm talking about fast track projects, talking about mega projects, I'm wondering if we could ask Alan uh, if he can describe some of the conditions that were either put in place or uh, some of the um, collaborative efforts that you've done on your, uh, with your team on the uh, arena uh, that will facilitate you hitting that deadline. Because I understand uh, we've got a hockey team that needs to move in and a Stanley Cup to win. So uh, can, can you tell us a bit about that? That's not going to happen all in one month, though, is it? It's going to take a while to win the Stanley Cup, sorry. but. Uh, <coughs> Uh, no, and in Georgia talks about mega projects a lot, and I think uh, there's been a lot of analogies to, to oil, and I think a lot of them are right here in the city. And anytime you do a project you're not used to, or your market hasn't seen, it, it should be deemed as a mega project. And on the arena, uh, in some aspect, uh, we got involved very early, so we did what George said. You got, in, you got involved in a procurement process and pre-construction. And we had probably 18 months of pre-construction on the project. So we were involved right from the get-go. When we got on board, there was six drawings. So we helped on that collaborative approach to go through that. And there was many, many uh, hours and hours in design meetings uh, along with different disciplines. We brought on some trade partners for some support through that and some of that, some of that value engineering up front. And also a lot of that collaboration <coughs> of what, it's, what the project's going to turn into. So many contractors saw it of what it was going to be, so they're getting prepared for it in their knowledge base. The team also did a lot of uh, touring, so we knew what was successful in other projects. So we looked in the past, so we wouldn't complete those issues and, and concerns. And it comes down to a lot more discipline, that every silo in that team worked together, but they were disciplined in terms of the money side, because I can share with you some backroom meetings between the city and the proponent who was, who was wanting to build the arena. There were some meetings we had some fun. Uh, they were across the table. And there's a reason they were across the table, because they couldn't sit side by side. And it was all over how much money there was to the scope you want to have. I, I would like to add to that. <laughs> um, you weren't in them, though. No, I wasn't. But, but I know that there was some tough slogging through that. And at the end of the day, it came down to making choices. And it was around 
this or something lesser than that or, or a different way to approach it. And I think, Matt, you talked about what was successful. It was truly that. It was, you had a vision, you had an idea, it was developed collaboratively. And in the end, it came down to when you needed to make a choice, it was informed by all parties. And I think that's why it's been successful. And the key thing as well, there was two rounds of heavy, heavy value engineering and optimization for those suggestions of this is too much, what can it be, and what's going to be acceptable to both the city, to the proponent who's going to run, the, run and take the risk on the building for revenue, and what the team needed to be successful over the term that they're committing to be here. So there was a lot of that collaboration that went through, and the project came together, but it came together probably a couple days before it had to go back to council. Um, it, it was a long process, and at times it was, as I say, very spirited discussions of yeah. what was going to go into that building. Can I share with you uh, an experience, a story about the South LRT that was built here a, a few years ago? And I was with the city team uh, just doing the team building. So the, it's a line, like a pipeline, and they cut it uh, geographically. So PCL was one contractor, Graham Construction was another one, and uh, uh, then excavation, and then the railway track, uh, another one. So they cut it in that, uh, that way. And it was a traditional contract, but from day one, the owner, the city in this case, put all the contractor in a day or two day session on the collaborative relationship. What's our common goal? What are our objectives? What are we trying to achieve? What is the success criteria? Uh, what are the success, key success factors to succeed? What needs to happen? Which approval needed when? And so basically that's the vision, the goal statement. And then we worked on, uh, developed a, a health check for the organization. How are we communicating? Uh, and how we are uh, um, dealing with issues? How are we going to deal with issues and uh, problems? And, and what's the ground rules? Who is doing what? Uh, uh, it's all about communication, guys. We, we, we focus on the scope. But again, the communication, working together as a team, is a great thing to happen. And one case where the station was done by another contractor. So the station in the middle of uh, either the section by PCL or Graham, I forgot. The station is another contractor. The station contractor got delayed for whatever reasons. But the city already signed a contract with the railway guys that he will have access. So now we have a problem in the middle of it. So the city and us brought everybody the, the, the contractor of the station and everybody from the city, and they work together. Then I asked the city, what is the last time you can give this contractor to get out without uh, any legal implication with your other contractor? With collaboration, you would not believe. We abandoned the exist old schedule. We started simple bar chart schedule. Simple bar, don't complicate your life. We have enough. Bar chart is enough, hand, hundred uh, drawn. And and, and guess what? They achieved it. But again, collaboration is not only at the very beginning, developing the scope, but also while we are doing the work, risk will emerge, things will happen, compromise need to be uh, achieved as well. I win, I lose, I lose one case, I win another case. Amazing. I, I'll tell you without any bias, if the owner and their uh, a consultant extend their hand to the contractor, and try to start the trust, the contractor will respond in kind. Trust me, this will happen. And without it, we will not succeed. So I really wanted to, to say this before we end uh, our discussion, but yeah. I just want to, want to go on one more thing that you had brought up with your inverted triangle in green and, and, and the others. That is how the arena is. We do have a, a leadership team at the top, which is really that benevolent dictator of the project from the owner side. And on the contractor side, we're very similar. We've got a small group of people that really manage the project on a day-to-day -day basis, and they meet weekly and resolve the issues weekly. Because to meet that schedule, there is no time for delays. That needs to be done quickly and efficiently, yeah. and, and that is what's happening. Yeah. Can you show the, the slide so we're going to conclude? And, and you can jump in if you want. Uh, Andrew, you look like, yeah. Yeah, no, I, and I think part of the challenge is, is the delivery methodology. And, you know, in the past, I think I said at the start, we've had to necessarily go with a CM because of we didn't have any planning done. But if you take the Royal Alberta Museum, which we will actually finish before you finish the arena, um, but we won't have fitted it out. Neil's driving my, our flagship project. And that's a hugely integrated way. Uh, and, and as an owner, we're 
heavily interested in and invested in IPD. Uh, Neil's involved with uh, CBDI, and we were out a couple of weeks ago with Defence Construction Canada, and as both as owners, we are committed to this, but we've got a lot of work to do internally.